we doing? Y'all fired up being in church? Virgil is. I'm excited too. Well, hey, welcome again to another weekly gathering of the Emmanuel Baptist Church where we exist to lead all people to know Christ, grow in Christ, and to go, go for what? I mean, it's not getting worse, so that's good. And thank you, all of you. This uh, church is faithful in giving. Uh, it has just been a blessing to see exactly how y'all give. It is. Thank you. Uh, as we continue in worship today, uh, we're going to turn to prayer as we have been. We've uh, gotten the ability to sing a song of praise to the Lord. We've gotten now the chance to worship Him uh, through giving offerings for the gospel. Now let's move forward in worship in a time of prayer where we really orient our hearts towards Him. I want to challenge you in these few moments of prayer uh, to love the Lord. Um, do it verbally in prayer. Also, make your confession to Him. Whatever you need to get off your chest as we proceed in worship today. And then uh, pray. Pray for your requests. Pray for those things on your heart. Also pray for someone else. And always be praying for your one uh, who you're praying that would come to know the Lord. Name their name to Him. And also pray for the boldness that you yourself will share the message when the time is given. Let's take a moment in prayer. Lord, we come to You today saying You are welcome in this place. You are amazing. You are our Savior. You are our Lord. You are our Creator, our Sustainer, our Provider, our Healer. Lord, we thank You that You hear us now. Uh, Lord, as we continue to worship You, forgive us for those sins that we do deliberately those things that we know we ought not, yet we make the choice to. And Lord, also please forgive us for those things we know to do. And we simply let them slip by. Lord, we want to serve You. We want to serve You better. Because You are worthy. We thank You that You tolerate us, quite frankly. We thank You that You still love us as children, even in our own sinfulness at times. Lord, You are altogether wonderful. Lord, I want to ask You to move. I want to ask You not only to move in this place and in every heart here today, but I want to ask You to move in our nation, in our world, even in our community. <coughs> save people. Lord, save our ones who we've been praying for. Lord, help us to play a part in it. Fill us with passion for the Gospel. Lord, save people. And Lord, bring revival. Don't let this world cool off to a love and recognition of You, but send a new fire. And Lord, also, we have some in our own families who who need healing. We have a great grandbaby in the hospital in Jacksonville. We have a, a daughter dealing with pneumonia and other health issues. Lord, we have many who are being burdened by this ongoing virus. And Lord, I ask for Your healing in all. We ask that Your will be done, but our hearts ask for healing. 
We thank You that You are awesome. We thank You that You are in this place. We thank You for Your Son, Jesus. And as we continue to worship You today, be blessed by our efforts. In Your name we pray. Amen. Continue to worship in song. One day when heaven was filled with His praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is He. Living He loved me, dying He saved me, buried He carried my sins far away. Rising He justified freely forever. One day He's coming, oh glory us day. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on the tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing my sins, my Redeemer is he. Living he loved me. Dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glory us Amazing grace shall always be my song of praise. For it was grace that bought my liberty. I do not know just why he came to love me so. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. I shall forever lift mine eyes to Calvary to view the cross where Jesus died for me. How marvelous the grace that caught my falling soul. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. I shall forever lift mine eyes to Calvary. To view the cross where Jesus died for me. How marvelous the grace that caught my falling soul. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining, till he appeared and the soul its worth, a thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and
and glorious morn. All on your knees. Oh, hear the angels' voices. Oh, night divine. Oh, oh night when Christ was born. Oh, night divine. Oh, night. Oh, night divine. Fall on your knees. Oh, hear the angel's voice. Christ was born all night divine all night all night Do y'all know it's getting near Christmas? See? I got proof. And these are lovely, by the way. Thank you. Look really nice. It's getting near Christmas, and what can happen uh, at, at Christmas time is a couple of different things, right? Uh, in one regard, we can get to thinking about the trappings of Christmas. You know, all the shopping we've got to get done, all the list of names you've got to get gifts for. I can show you my wife's spreadsheet of gifts and what they've been for the last few years. It's insane. Actually, it's making me nervous. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Oh, you're in here today. Oh, easy. Should have taken that illustration out. But it's easy to get distracted at Christmas. And, but my hope is, as, we, as you may have noticed, we're going to begin a new book of the Bible today, and you should be excited about it. We're going to start the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to make our way towards the Christmas story. And my prayer for us all is that we start actually orienting our hearts towards real Christmas. Not everything about Christmas, but the one whom Christmas is about. What's his name? Jesus, yeah. So effort to do that. We're going to start the book of Matthew. Today we're going to look at a very exciting passage. It's going to be chapter 1, verse, uh, verses 1 down through verse 17. And please don't everyone cheer at once, but it is the genealogy of Jesus. And I, I know y'all are excited, but it'll make sense. Uh, what I want to tell you as we get started today, and my, my fear is, uh, I heard recently that this year they've labeled the number one cause of death in the world as COVID. Well, we'll debate that later. But typically, there is a number one cause of death in the world that kills uh, near 700,000, 600, 700,000 people a year in the U.S. alone, and it's heart disease. I know, what does this have to do with anything? Hang in there. But I, what I want to submit today is that the bigger problem, the bigger killer, the bigger thing that results in death and eternal death is heart disease, but not the physical heart, but the spiritual one. In an effort to combat that, what we need is a steady diet of the bread of life, the Word of God. So today we will begin the book of Matthew. It is 28 chapters. I have no idea how long it's going to take us to go through Matthew, but I promise I'll try to make it fun. We're going to see some cool things. We're going to see some nice things. Um, but what I need you to grasp today as we 
kind of getting started is set up with uh, some introductory material. Uh, you got to kind of know the author. It's better to know kind of the, the context of a situation to understand better what's going on. So let me give you a, a little bit of introductory material because I know you've read this book. I know many of you here have read and even taught through Matthew your entire lives. Uh, many of you probably communicate far better than I, but what I want to what I want to encourage you please to do as we work through Matthew, let it be a fresh word. Don't look at a passage and say, well, I know what that says. Well, just hang on. Let's walk through it together. Let's read it together. Read it prayerfully and see exactly what all we can get out of it. Because at the, at the, just the pinnacle of everything, especially in Matthew, is Jesus. This book is all about Him. But surprise, the whole book, <laughs> this entire book is about him. So what we're going to start with is the Gospel of Matthew. It's called the Gospel according to Matthew. Now the Gospel uh, just means in this regard that is an account of the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, it is not necessarily what is known properly as the Gospel that Christ lived, died, three days later rose again. But what it is is a gospel account, meaning that it is an account of the life of Jesus. We know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels that tell us about Christ. But Matthew is, is different than the other ones in the sense that this is written by a 100% Jewish man, uh, really for a Jewish audience. Uh, if you read Matthew chapter 9, which we'll get to you know, some months down the road, uh, you'll know that Matthew himself was also called Levi. He was a tax collector. Familiar with tax collectors in this time period? Uh, they were beloved by all, as they are today. Uh, Matthew, would have, he was a tax collector, and what that meant was he was actually a Jew uh, from Israel, living there with his people, but he was an employee of the Roman Empire. And what Rome did was they would require a tax to be paid, and he was in charge of collecting it. However, what a tax collector is able to do in that day is to actually take whatever percentage of tax they want and keep the extra. For example, if Rome had a 10% tax on what you had, he could actually ask for 25 and keep the 15% himself. So this man would have been hated by all the regular people, as some tax collectors are today. But there came a point in his life when the Lord saw him in his tax collecting booth and he called him to follow him and he did. Now, as a Jew writing this book, he has two points he's trying to make. And what you've got to realize the whole time we're in Matthew, and when you read Matthew on your own, there's two points that he's trying to make and two reasons that he wrote this account. The first one is, remember, it is a Jewish audience. He's first trying to make the point that this Jesus, not a general Jesus, which it was a common name at the time, but Jesus uh, of Nazareth, this one born of Mary, is two things that he doesn't want anyone to miss. First, he is the rightful king of Israel. That's the point he's going to make, and he's actually going to start making it even in our passage today. And number two, he's making the point, as all the gospel writers are, that this is the long-awaited Messiah. This is the one you've been waiting for. And throughout this whole book, that is the argument he's trying to make, and then the book serves as evidence to that. And if you actually, if you read, when you read through it, you'll notice in Matthew, there's actually 35 prophecies specifically fulfilled in the book of Matthew by Jesus. And that's all evidence kind of in his court case of what the deal is. But here's what's something interesting. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but some statisticians and math people, I went to seminary, I don't do math, but some people that do went together and put together all these percentages and these statistics of the chances that prophecies would be fulfilled by one person. Uh, they said, okay, if, if the Bible's full of over 350 prophecies of Jesus in the Old Testament, what are the chances, they just said five, let's just say five, what are the chances that this one man fulfilled five of those prophecies in one person? And what was interesting is the number they gave had like, a 10 with, some, I don't know, it was a weird number. I don't know math. It was some large number, so I needed another way of understanding it. And I found one guy who simplified it, dumbed it down for us Georgians and Arkansas people. We can understand this. He said, what it is, is it's actually what you got to imagine. Here's the chances that Jesus would actually fulfill five prophecies. Uh, you take the state of Texas. I'll think of all that land. You fill it two foot high with quarters. And then you send a blind man to find one specific quarter. 
And here, Matthew, throughout the book, is going to give us 35 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled from the Old Testament. And in total, Jesus fulfilled 351 Old Testament prophecies. This book's always been about him. The Old Testament was all about him, pointed to him coming. Now, Matthew's going to make the case that this is the one you've been waiting for, and I'm going to show you as a Jew evidence for it. And also, don't forget Luke 24, 22, or 22, 44, where Jesus himself said, There are words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. Everything written about me and the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled, and therefore we will see many things. But before we get to prophecies, we've got to get through a genealogy. Now, don't everybody scream at once. It's not that bad. I know you do your devotions out of the book of Numbers, don't you? You go over there and see who begat who. Count all of them. Yeah, I know it's thrilling. But I tell you what, don't, don't just blow off numbers. It's, it's in the Bible. It's pretty exciting. There's some different stuff in there that you might not know about. At one point, the ground opens and swallows people. It's a neat story. Another story, fiery snakes are running all around biting people, and they have to look at a snake on a pole to be saved. Don't, hey, don't neglect numbers. There's some stuff in there other than numbers. But... What we need to see today is a genealogy of Jesus, and it's important. And the reason that Matthew begins with this is that he is going to prove through lineage that Jesus is two things. He is the rightful king, and he is the Messiah. So let's look at it first. Let's just go ahead and get into some of it and read a few verses of it, and then we'll talk about it. Matthew 1, beginning in verse 1, says... The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now this right out of the gate is important. You'll note that it is a book or a collection of the genealogy or the lineage of Jesus, the one who is the Christ. And it says he's the son of David. It's important that he is, draws attention to the son of David because it was David whose line was going to be the king eternal in Israel. And also it's important that he points out he was also a son of Abraham because Abraham was the founder of God's chosen people, the Israelites, the Jews. And it, what, these, what this proves right, off, right out of the gate is that Jesus in the line of Abraham is proper because he's Jewish and in the line of David is proper because that is the kingly line. Now, uh, I'm going to read verses 2 through 6. And then I promise you, we're not going to talk about every one of these people because I'm not going to get you out at 8 o'clock tonight. But listen as the Bible says, verse 2. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron father of Ram, Ram father of Amenadab, and Amenadab the father of Nashon, Nashon father of Salmon, Salmon father of Boaz by Rahab, that's important. And Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth. Also interesting. Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David was the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah. Now, right out of the gate, we see a bunch of names. Uh, I thought of titling this message, This Tree is Full of Nuts. Uh, because if you go back and you read the story of these people, that are listed so far in this lineage. There's some insane stuff. Now, I promised you we're not going to walk through every one of them, but I do need you to see a few. And what I want you to do is see these because these are examples of imperfect people used by God. And the key to their being used by God was not anything they brought to the table except their willingness to be used. God only uses willing people not necessarily the expected people to accomplish his purposes. Let me show you some examples. First, verse 2. Abraham, we know the father of Isaac. Abraham, he's the great father of the Jews. You know, his name was Abram, and he had no children. Him and his wife, near 100-year-old, finally have a kid. And, and the interesting thing about Abram, if you go back to Genesis 12, he is called out of nowhere by God. Seemingly, he's just going along with his life, and then one day... God calls to him out of nowhere and says, hey, take all your stuff, take your family and your stuff, and leave all your family behind, all your extended family, you and your wife, pack up your stuff and go. And just go, and I'll show you on the way where you're going. Basically, he has to be blindly follow me. Great thing about Abraham is he was willing enough to do that very thing. And we could stop there and maybe praise him for his willingness in that regard 
But if you read more about the story of Abraham, he was far from perfect. For shortly after he started this journey, they entered Egypt, and he realized that Sarah, his wife, was an attractive woman. He was afraid that the Egyptians would kill him to get his lady. So he said, oh, she's my sister. Hmm. So this guy, chosen by God out of nowhere, is willing, he's following him blindly, however, he's not perfect. This guy lied. This guy, once he, him and his wife got the announcement that they would have a child in their old age, his wife doubted. He then got the servant girl pregnant. You know, can I tell you, just as an aside, if you read the story of Abraham, even if your spouse doubts, it doesn't mean you have to. You can still follow the Lord yourself. And he was far from perfect. He, he messed up a lot along the way. But he was also the guy with whom God made a covenant. If you remember the covenant he made with him, God said, I will bless you. I'm going to give you, even though you're old and have no kids, I'm going to give you children to number the stars in the sky, the sand on the seashore. And he said, all the earth will be blessed through you. And he started the Jewish people, God's chosen people, with Abraham. And why did he start with Abraham? Not because he was the best thing going or the most qualified, but because he was willing. And God knew it. Now, if you skip down on the list, there's some crazy things we could talk about. We could talk about Judah and Tamar. That's a really fun story. Go read that sometime. But what I want you to notice is verse 5, this second name that I'll submit should not appear in this genealogy. And Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. Rahab. If somebody doesn't belong in a lineage of Jesus Christ, his family tree, this lady has no business here. This is a Canaanite prostitute. You remember Joshua 6? They came in, spies went into the town, the scope out Canaan. They come across a woman of ill repute named Rahab. And what did she do? Now, you would think what she would do as a Baal-worshipping, possible even temple prostitute, woman in that regard, you would think that she would turn her back on these spies and turn them over and maybe even kill them herself. But what does she do? The, the actual Bible reads in Joshua 6 that she heard the reputation of Yahweh God and what He'd done for His people already and she believed Him. And she believed in it. And she believed that Yahweh God, Israel's God, our true God, was the Lord in that regard. There she ends up in this very lineage of Jesus. And I just want to suggest that if she was a pagan, Baal-worshipping prostitute, and she can be used of God to bring about Jesus Christ, and who can't be used? Who can't be used? And also think about if she's existed in that state, and she's used in the lineage, in the very family tree of Jesus What's our excuse? Are we active in the story? I'm sure most of you wouldn't consider yourself a Canaanite prostitute. <laughs> but she was willing. She heard the Word of God. She believed it. She took action on it. And now she ends up crucial piece of the story of Jesus. And even over in Hebrews 11, the hall of faith, this lady shows up because she believed God and she took action on it. Not because she was perfect, but because she was willing. A uh, couple other names I want you to get real quick. Also in verse 5, after Rahab, then there was Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. Now if you haven't read Ruth lately, it's a beautiful story, but this is another woman who does not belong in the lineage of Jesus. She has no business there. She wasn't even an Israelite. She did not belong. She was a Moabitess, which is a descendant of Lot by his oldest daughter, not a great line to be a part of. She also worshipped a demon god, and uh, the Moabites constantly fought with Israel for years and years. And yet, here she appears in the very line of Jesus, just a couple of generations from David himself. How could this be? Well, if you remember her story, uh, her whole family was living in Moab. Uh, her and her sister were married to uh, Israelite boys. Uh, the boys died and then uh, she was left, the sister actually left him as well. She abandoned him and went back home. And then the mother, uh, the mother-in-law, 
and Ruth were the only ones left. That's a blessing to you, just to be left with you and your mother-in-law. I know. That's fine. The mother-in-law, Naomi, comes to her and, he, and she says, look, go back to your people. Just leave me. Everything's gone terribly wrong. You just go on home. And here's what she said in Ruth chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Here's Ruth's words. Oh, well, Naomi first speaks. See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people. Return after your sister. And Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. How about that? Her faithfulness to God and specifically to one of God's people shows her devotion to Him. So here's this lady Ruth who wasn't an Israelite. She had no part with Israel. And now we see her grafted into this story in verse 5 of Jesus. If she can find her way into this story through faithfulness to the Lord, then what's our excuse for not being part of His story as well? If the words of Jesus were written now, if we took this lineage to a different way and, and made it service a list of the great servants of the Lord, would your name appear? And what, don't be thrown by that because you don't have to do anything necessarily worldly great to be on a list like that. Just like every one of these names we've seen so far, it wasn't their ability, it was their availability. They heard the Lord. They were willing to follow Him. What's great about God is when He calls you to serve Him, all He wants you to do is come, bring whatever you got, whatever you're lacking, He'll give you the rest to accomplish what He's got for you to do. Willingness and ability. Two different things. Availability and willingness, most important. So, let me give you one. Well, yeah, we'll just do one more. And this one is another one. He's a famous one. I know, and y'all probably love this guy. There's been books written on how wonderful King David was. And he is a great example. But I'd also suggest that if me or you were actually creating ourselves the lineage that would bring about the perfect to Jesus, I submit that David wouldn't belong. Now we say, of course he does. Right? He's a big deal. He was, he's the one after God's own heart. We know he killed Goliath. Uh, he wrote a bunch of the Psalms, right? David's a pretty cool dude. Well, don't forget this. He was actually the last son of his father, Jesse. In that culture, it's virtually no status. There's nothing to the last son. Yet he was chosen by God. Not only was he of no status, really, in that regard, he was quite the killer. You now, he's famous for killing Goliath, but the Bible records he's killed thousands and ten thousands. Also, don't forget, uh, as it mentions here, David was the father of Solomon. Uh, and it doesn't name his wife, but he says by the, the wife of Uriah. Because don't forget, this is David, this one uh, who is in this very line, is the one who also slept with another man's wife, got her pregnant, killed her husband to cover for it. Great example. But he appears here. Why? He's also the one that God made a covenant with. The one that God came to and said, your line is going to rule forever. How could that be? How could that be? Because regardless of the road David took, even though it winded and bent and turned, his heart was always wanting to serve the Lord. And so often, I think his picture probably reflects ours more than we'll even admit, because even while we take the path of wanting to serve the Lord, so often don't doesn't our track, it's just nothing linear. <laughs> if you follow with our road, it's bent and turned everywhere. But David had a heart that was rooted in wanting to honor and serve the Lord. And that made all the difference. Mistakes were made on his road, but yet he wanted to stay on the road. And wouldn't it be true, if, if you were going to write up the, the lineage of Jesus, you wouldn't put a killer adulterer, insignificant last son of a guy. He wouldn't show up in that list. But his heart was dedicated to the Lord. Therefore, he's actually the kingly line forever. So, these four examples we've seen here are people that you and I certainly wouldn't have placed in this lineage, but God did, and why did He do it? Not because they were perfect, because they were devoted to Him. 
He doesn't look for ability. He looks for availability, and then he provides the ability. Now, these are four positive examples to be sure. And there's other ones as well. Go back, read through this in and, and, and your Bible, even if you've a, uh, if you've got a chain reference Bible or a cross reference Bible, it'll give you little letters that take you to the Scripture where all these people's stories appear. Go back, work through these, read through some of these crazy stories. These people do not belong here, but they are here to bring about the Savior. But let me just give you one more that's not a positive example. Over in verse 10 down to verse 10. And Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amos. Amos, the father of Josiah. This guy, Manasseh, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He was one of the final kings of Judah before they fell uh, to Babylon. And he was utterly terrible. Virtually no redeeming quality. Actually, the, the, the line was removed from his family completely, how bad he was. Here's just some of his highlights. Remember, he was the king in Judah. He was ruling over God's people. But he built altars to Baal and Asherah. These are fertility gods. Uh, also, he built altars to, to other idols and to other gods in the temple in Jerusalem. The place where God's Spirit used to dwell. He offered sacrifices to demons. And actually one of them who he burned as a sacrifice was his own son. He was also used, it says he used fortune telling and necromancy. All these things that were forbidden for a Jew to partake in. He moved Israel closer to being judged by God. That poor leadership. So why is, it, why is somebody like that in this line? Well, to me, there's several reasons, but one, because let me tell you, it doesn't matter who the king is on earth, God's plan's going to happen. I'll say it doesn't matter who the president is, God's plan's going to happen. And this guy, as awful as he was, even worshiping other idols and offering his son, literally burning his son to a demon god, couldn't stop the plan of God. Let me encourage you, nothing can if that doesn't. So this genealogy of Jesus, we, we've just I've selected a few just to look at. But what I, the point I want to make is that this is one crazy family tree full of nuts. So what are we going to make of it? What do we do with this? Matthew's put this here. We've got to deal with it. What do we get out of it, right? We've got to draw some nectar from this. What do we get? Well, let me give you four quick things. First, the point of this genealogy, which I know most of us, when we're going to read Matthew, we don't start here. We start in verse 18 when Christmas comes. But the point of this is important because it establishes that Jesus has the proper lineage to be the king. And a king is king as long as they're alive. Well, Jesus isn't going to die again. <laughs> Therefore, he's the eternal king. That's what Matthew has shown here. He's proper lineage. Also, he is a Jew. And then also, he's the line of David because he is the proper king. This is you, what you need to know as we go through Matthew. Everything he's doing is trying to prove this. But what do we do with it for ourselves? Uh, how does this affect us as we go you know, we've seen some of these. We've looked at some of these. And in their story, I want you to understand yourself that it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter what regrets you have. What matters is what you do with Jesus right now. That's the only thing that matters. You say, well, I've taken a pretty crazy road. Yeah? Have you asked for forgiveness? You know, He grants forgiveness to 100% of the sins a sincere heart asks forgiveness for. It doesn't matter where you come from. He accepts all kinds. He even accepts you. Not only that, number three, your family tree doesn't determine your usefulness to God or your eternal destination. You want a life of meaning? A life of significance and actually eternal significance. It's in submission to and availability to and service to Christ. 
Anything less than that, you are literally wasting your life. You are given this one life to live. We need to give it all to God. Don't make excuses. Don't say, well, you don't know what kind of family I had. I don't care. He knows, and He's still calling you to follow and serve Him. Well, you don't know what I've done. You don't... I can tell you several that we've talked about. I, these people. <laughs> Have you ever burned your son on the altar? <laughs> You're not as bad as you could be. You want eternal significance. Be completely willing to follow and to serve. Number four. And this is where it kind of turns. God doesn't tolerate sin forever. Uh, we see this with these kings. It actually, if you see verse 12, it says, or verse 11, it says, at the time of the deportation to Babylon. Because there is a point where Israel and Judah's sin became too much. God had all He was going to tolerate of it, and His judgment came through these other nations coming and deporting His people. And I'll tell you as well today, there is a day that will come, either when you die or the Lord returns, that it'll be too late for you to make a choice what you're going to do with Jesus. The time will have been passed. But today is a day you can choose to come to Him and accept His free offer of forgiveness. If you're a Christian, He still grants forgiveness. If you've never accepted the Lord, He grants forgiveness. I don't know what you've done. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you're going through. But He'll forgive it if you ask Him to. If you'll admit that you are a sinner, that you have done wrong, but you will believe that Jesus is the Savior who was born of a virgin, which we'll see next week, lived a perfect life, died on a cross in place for your sin and for mine, and then three days later, He got out of the grave as a testimony that His work was finished and we can be saved. Because... As long as you're breathing, it's not too late. It's not too late to, if you're a Christian already, a child of God, it's not too late to begin to live a life of significance and service to Him. If you're not a Christian and still breathing, it's also not too late to come to Him for the first time. You can come to Him today. And I'll just suggest that as this is Christmas season, a time when everything should really be angling towards Christ in a powerful way as we celebrate His birth soon. Use this as a time to get closer to Him. You know, He came as a baby. And we like to worship the baby, but He didn't stay a baby. He grew up and He went to a cross. And He died there for my sin. And He died there for your sin. And you know, because of that, we should love Him. We should worship Him. We should follow Him. And we should serve Him in all we can. Because it's all about Jesus. Amen? Pray with me. Lord, as we enter this season of celebration of Your birth, the moment where You left heaven to enter this broken creation so that You would actually die for Your broken, sinful creatures. Lord, help us not to get lost in the lights of Christmas but focus in this time on the light of the world. We thank You that You came. Lord, I ask if there's one here today who's never accepted Your light for the first time, that they would today. And in this moment of invitation, we'll have that they'll come forward. And they'll pray to receive You for the first time. Lord, I pray for all of us here that in this moment of invitation that we will have, it won't be a time where we sing a song with our mouths, but that we'll do business with You in our hearts. Thank You that through Jesus, there's a way to draw close to You. I pray that people draw closer to You today. Begin with me and all of us, Lord. Bring us closer to You. We thank You for Jesus. And in His name we pray. Amen.